actually seem to like it. You know the ones I'm talking about. The lucky ones. The talented ones. The special ones. They like work because, for them, it just works. But then, every now and again, you meet someone. You know, they just seem to have a purpose. Be on a mission. They seem to be working for a whole different reason. For them, work seems to have meaning. It seems to give life purpose. They seem passionate, transformed. Who are these people? What is this passion they've discovered? Where do I find it? How do I learn why we work? Because if I could figure that out, if I could discover that secret, if I found out that my work matters, well, that would change everything. Well, good morning. Enjoying the service, uh, the series, the sermon series, Living on Purpose. I'm really excited about the series and I hope that you've benefited from it. Last Friday I had a lunch meeting with uh, several representatives of uh, different mission agencies and they told me that there are eight large traditional mission agencies who are working together to create an online platform to equip people to be a light for Christ in their workplace. And uh, one of these uh, partners is Missional Impact who came here last November and we held a conference Living on Purpose uh, that they developed uh, after having a conversation with us at HIF last year February and so they are the pioneer of this uh, group of mission agencies and we are the pioneer church that's running this program for the first time and so hopefully a lot of other churches uh, will be running this as well and really hope that it's been helpful to you if you have not yet uh, bought the devotional, they're still available. And uh, even as I was talking to two of our members before a service, uh, they are using it daily and they're using it with their small group. And that has benefited them so much more than just coming on Sunday. So it's not too late to start using this in your daily devotional. It's not too late to start using it in your connect group or meet with a friend and talk about it. So they're still available after service. Uh, if you would like to have one. But today is the last uh, day, the last in the series of seven. And the first one, if you remember, we talked about having a big picture of God. If you want to find purpose in your work life, first you need to step back and see how big God is. And then see from God's perspective, His vision. For work in general, just like was mentioned in the video clip that we watched, you know, why does God have us work? Isn't it cursed? Well, it's not. Work is not cursed. Work is a reflection of who God is. And so when we have this perspective of work, suddenly work takes on a whole new meaning. We can serve God and even worship Him as we go to work. But then how can you make daily decisions with this kind of kingdom mindset and Pastor Ryan spoke on that during week four and then two weeks ago we talked about loving with radical love, this agape love, this love that Christ had for us, this love that God has for us, that he even gave his only son for us, this kind of radical love expressed in our workplace on a daily basis. And then last week we talked about living out in the open. So once you have a big picture of God and a biblical perspective of your work and you're loving the people around you with this radical love, then it's a good time to let people know about Jesus Christ and that you're a Christian and that everything that you do comes out of that relationship. But then today we want to talk about practicing the presence of God. When we gather here on Sunday morning, it's, it's just such a beautiful thing. I was just reflecting on that as we are worshiping. I'm just thinking about what if we could invite the Communist Party from Hanoi 
into this room and see us. It would be just astounding, this kind of experience to them that we are from all across the world, worshiping Christ, finding our meaning and purpose and our identity as we commune with Him. But how can we take what we've experienced on Sunday morning into our Monday through Saturday work life? How can we practice this presence of God in our daily work? Some have thought, well, if I just quit my job and I start working for a church or become a miss missionary, you know, then I can get to know God much more deeply and personally. Well, this is really not the case necessarily. It's for everyone the same, whether you're in full-time church ministry or in missions or in school and education or in business or in diplomacy. It's the same practice counts for every one of us is to experience God's presence on a daily basis. How many of you have Facebook? Let's see how many are on Facebook. I know we have a few rebels in our midst who are not Facebook users. <laughs> what if Mark Zuckerberg, if you didn't know, if he created Facebook, what if he said this? I am the vine. You are the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you will be very productive. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, how close to reality is that? It's almost scary. It is actually really scary to think that, oh, well, he could have said that and it would be true for millions and millions of people around the world. Did you know that the average user, at least in the US, the average user uh, is on social media two hours a day and half of that time, an hour a day is spent on Facebook and the rest on other apps like Snapchat or Instagram, Twitter, etc. So last week when we ended the sermon, I put this scripture on on the screen with a great uh, background, if you remember, you know, with this uh, verse of obviously that Jesus said. But then we wonder, is, what does it mean to abide in Christ? You know, it's, it's a strange word that we don't use often in our daily language. What does it mean to remain in Jesus on a, on a daily basis? And I'm telling you, they have figured this out. They have big manuals that uh, describe the psychology of the user and how to hook them so that they can keep you on their platform as much as possible. So their whole goal is to have you abide in them as much time as they can get from you because then they monetize their platform. And so, frankly, we all know what it means to abide in something. Do you know that people on average pick up their mobile phone 85 times a day to check what it says? You know, did somebody like my message? Did somebody make a comment? Did somebody respond to me? Is there an email? And that somehow is affirming to us. We're looking for words of affirmation from this social media. But what, what if we would treat our relationship with God in the same way? What if we, 85 times a day, pick up the scripture, open it, read a verse, it's like, wow, it says something about me there. What if, what if we did that, spent one or two hours with God and commune with Him? What if we would gain our identity from the word rather than from social media? What if we would experience strong emotions? Our, our likes and our dislikes from when we read the word. Psalmist, obviously he didn't have a mobile phone or a Facebook account, but he said, you God are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. 
in a dry and parched land where there is no water? I have seen you in the sanctuary, and I have beheld your power and your glory, because your love is better than life. My lips <coughs> will glorify you. Know, David, King David, before, probably before he was a king, when he was chased by King Saul into the desert. We know him as the psalmist writer. He would worship God while shepherding sheep. But he obviously has experienced God's presence in the temple, in the church for the Jews. He's experienced God's presence in church service. But now he's out there in the world. And he's experiencing a dry in a weary place, longing for God. And even though he can't get back to the temple, he wants to experience God right where he is. And isn't that, for some of us, how work is? That we think church on Sunday morning is where we experience God's and his power and presence, but during the week it's just a dry and weary place. What if God would meet us right we might have that same experience of His presence in our work life. So how do we abide in Christ? How do we remain in Jesus divine? How do we commune with God? It's, since it's not just about Sunday morning worship, not even your morning devotions before you head off to work, but also in your place of work as you work during the day, as you go through the stresses of work life, as you face the challenges and the difficulties. The brother Lawrence was a monk during the 17th century, and often, you know, we might think about those days when the monks were in communes worshiping God daily, and, and it must have been easy for them. They didn't have a real job like I have. But in fact, Brother Lawrence, unlike many other monks, his job was to work in the kitchen. And he had an exchange of letters with a very close friend. And this exchange of letters was put into a book for him called The Practice of the Presence of God. It's an e-book. It's free. Uh, no copyright. It's already four centuries old. So you can actually read this. I read it. It's really inspiring. And he talks about how through his daily duties in the kitchen and going out to the market and meeting with suppliers and, and, and just his daily manual work, mundane labor, how he could experience God, even though he was not in the chapel, he was in the kitchen, experiencing God's presence intentionally during his work day. What if we could experience that like, like this? He wrote that in the midst of your work, console yourself with him as often as you can. We do not have to be constantly in church to be with God. We can make our heart a prayer room into which we can retire from time to time to converse with him gently, humbly, lovingly. Everyone is capable of these familiar conversations with God, some more and some less. He knows what our capabilities are. So we don't have to feel guilty if somebody's praying more than you are. He knows what our capabilities are. Let us begin. For perhaps he is only awaiting a generous resolve on our part. And so what if we practice this presence of God in our workplace? Perhaps during our mealtime in conversations, Perhaps before you head into a meeting, or you're getting ready to prepare a presentation. Or maybe suddenly someone is dropping a whole bunch of work on your desk. Or you're going through nights of grading papers. We intentionally bring God into that place of work. As the staff of HIF, we are going through uh, strengths finders. I don't know if you've ever done this, actually based on uh, research. And uh, it's been very helpful to us. And I found that uh, one of my strengths is uh, achiever. And a phrase to describe the achiever is every day starts at 
zero. And achievers, at the end of the day, you must achieve something tangible in order to feel good about yourself every day. And not just Monday through Saturday, or even Sunday on your day, day off. You know, the phrase that the achiever would say is, let's do something, or let's get this thing done. Anybody else tell you that? Well, I'm sure there's quite a number of achievers here in our room, because if you weren't an achiever, you would have never achieved to even move here to Hanoi and live an expat life. But a challenge for us achievers is that we can work all day, keep all day achieving one thing to another to another, just to feel good about ourselves at the end of the day, and then just forget that to commit our work to the Lord throughout the day. You know, if God is really our ultimate boss, we really should check in with our boss once in a while, shouldn't we? And I'm preaching to myself just as I'm preaching to you, so don't think of that I'm doing any better than you are. Of course, being diligent and being responsible honors God. And a lot of Proverbs talk about this. But if we want to serve our bosses and clients wholeheartedly, we serve them as we serve the Lord. And yet, the psalmist wrote that unless the Lord builds a house, the builders are laboring in vain. And unless the Lord watches over the city, or your company, your school, your organization, your ministry, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain they rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. You know, our identity is so wrapped up in our achievements and in our accomplishments. We are wired that way. It's obviously not wrong because we are made in the image of God. And He loves to work and so we love to work. But what are we toiling for? You know, are we toiling so that we become an expert in our field? So that we become the go-to person and everybody looks up to us? It's so easy to lose track of what God's purpose is for us in our busyness. And the worry would be that at the end, all of our achievements might just be in vain. And it's not just for those who have a, a job and a business. It's even for us who are in ministry. You know, in ministry, uh, we also desire to have a significance to you know, to have this thought of, I believe that God is preparing me for a significant role for His kingdom. Somehow we elevate a role that someone else has about what He has asked us to do. And we create some kind of a hierarchy in the kingdom of God and we think, well, we will achieve even more, even greater things if I have this role. And instead of serving God, through our work, we might end up <coughs> worshipping our work. Worshipping the excitement of our jobs or the affirmations that we get through work. Or the reputation of being someone significant, whether it's in ministry or in the marketplace. But what if God asks you to do something that's really insignificant and mundane? You know, what day, or week, or year's work would Jesus look at and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. How would God divine, define faithfulness? What does He actually expect from us? Well, He said so through the prophet Micah. He said, well, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God? And this transcends any industry in which we might be working. And this definition of faithfulness brings 
a whole new level of freedom. That we can find identity in Christ and trust Him for the results. And if we so do, then we actually definitely will stand out in our workplace. Yet, we all know, we are like sheep prone to wander, to stray. And God needs to draw us back. And if you're anything like me, God has a knack for using difficult times to draw me back to Him. Isn't it when things are getting really hard and tough that we run back to God? And He has such a way to use these times of stress and difficulties and problems and hardships to produce perseverance and character and hope in each one of us. The Apostle Paul had suffered a lot and he wrote, We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Sure, we do. And this is what we do when we get together and we worship God together. But it's not just on Sunday mornings when we praise Him. It's also we glory in our sufferings, in our hardships, when things get really hard in our workplaces, in our relationships. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character, hope. And this hope is being produced through suffering. This hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. It is those times that we are so desperate for God to intervene in our difficulties, in our challenges, in our hardships, in our sufferings, that His Spirit is poured out into us and expressed through love. It's this kind of suffering that also helps us to identify with Christ. Dorothy Sayers wrote that Jesus cannot exact nothing from men that he has not exacted from himself. He has himself gone through the whole of human experience. From the trivial irritations of family life. Remember his brothers didn't even believe him until after his death. And resurrection. And the cramping restrictions of hard work. He was raised a carpenter. He was in the construction business. And even the lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, even unto death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born into poverty, and he died in disgrace. And he thought it worth while. You know, the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus voluntarily chose to identify with us, with our lives. He became one of us. Hebrews 2 says that Jesus himself suffered and he was tempted. And he was able to help those who are being tempted. Because Jesus was tempted in every way. Just as we are being tempted. Yet, he did not sin. There's this uh, Japanese art form called Kintsu Kuroi, and I'm sorry Japanese, I probably <laughs> did not say that right. But Kintsu Kuroi, it's really cool. They take broken pottery and repair it with gold, so that at the end it actually looks more beautiful, where all the cracks are filled up with gold and they put them back together again, and then just this gold beautifies what would have been something that we would have thrown into the trash. And it's so much like our lives and how God treats us. The Apostle Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, 
who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort. And this, in the areas, especially the areas of our, of our brokenness, the areas that we are struggling in, the areas where we really need God at work in our lives, is where as if He is pouring out gold into the cracks of our lives. And that becomes our shining moment, our bright opportunities to display Christ in our lives because it's not our perfection but it's Christ's perfection in us that tells the story and so if we have learned one thing throughout this whole series living on purpose in our workplace we would have learned that we desperately need God at work that we need Jesus in our lives. That we need the Holy Spirit to transform us as we go about our daily work. But we also need one another. We need each other for encouragement, for support, to spur each other on. Just like Chelsea was saying, she not only attends our Sunday service, but she read the devotional every day and then discussed it in her small group. And this has really been really meaningful to her and changed the way she goes to work every day. We need to encourage one another. And this is why God has created church. He has created this community, this body of Christ to help you. The author of Hebrews says that, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises faithful, but also... Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And where else are you going to do that than in a place of work where you spend a third of your lifetime? But not meeting, not giving up, meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now it's not for those in church who are the ones who do ministry, those in, in leadership who are ministering to you. No, their role is to equip you so that you can do the ministry, the works of service. Paul writes, Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. For from Him the whole body, joined together and held together by, uh, by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So when we do get together, we serve one another, to build one another up, to grow in our faith, working towards unity, and to grow in our maturity, working towards Christ's likeness. And it's through this loving service to one another that we all do our part. But church ministry is, is not just what happens when we get together. It's not just what happens when we gather on Sunday mornings. We are also the church when we're scattered in our workplaces, when each of us go to our domains of work. When we gather, we equip one another for ministry and for maturity. But as we scatter, we are the salt and we are the light in each of our work domain. But we need the church community to build one another up. So that our work doesn't, 
is not just about hanging in and surviving, but our work really becomes about thriving and living on purpose. But like it or not, the reality is that much of our work will go through the shredder. And all your projects and your programs, your proposals, your projections, all the prestige that you've been building up will be shredded by someone someday. You know, one day you'll, you'll leave your position, one day you'll leave your office, your company, your organization, one day you'll leave your work life, and then what? Who knows what will happen with all that you've worked for? Will people still care about all your treasured achievements? The author of Ecclesiastes realized that after he'd done so many grandiose building projects, he wrote, I hated all the things that I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Have you ever been in this kind of place? I'm sure you've left your job somewhere else to come here. And maybe you're planning to leave the job you're doing now to go somewhere else. And the person who is going to take your job, can you trust that person to care as much about your work as you've cared for it? We have no idea if the person who comes after us will be wise or foolish. That's why it's so good to focus on the ultimate outcome that we're working for. The Apostle Paul, at the end of his working life, he wrote, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. The time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. At the end, when we stand firm and we have fought a good fight, when we didn't just win a short sprint, but we have finished the marathon. And even though our faith has been tested, we have held on to it and kept it. We also will receive this award, this crown of righteousness. C.T. Studd was a missionary in China when he had received a very large inheritance from his father. And even before he knew how much it was, he had given it away to an orphanage. And C.T. Studd wrote this, he said, Only one life, it will soon be passed. But only what's done for Christ will last. And so when we do our jobs as if we are working for Jesus Christ himself, that is the only way to make our work last. And there's a lot that we do today in our work that really does matter. And that does count for eternity. And maybe a really good question for you to help you see that is to ask the question, in a hundred years, what will matter most about my daily work now? Or another question, if Christ returns, and assuming we all continue to work, because God's image is that He works, so will we work. In the eternity we will work, we will still have the same <coughs> job. And if we might have the same job, what would that look like? For eternity. Not that we have the same job for eternity. But let's say on the other side of Jesus' return. We have the job that we have today. 
what would that look like? And how might it look differently? And if it is different, how can we change our work today to make it more look like what it would be in eternity? The Hebrews says, so let us throw off everything that hinders, the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race that's marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. And so work, work in fact can be a very worshipful experience of God's presence in your workplace, especially if we learn how to commune with God in our, in our daily tasks, when we work to serve God and to trust Him for the results of our work, and when we lean into Jesus, when we face challenges and difficulties in our work, when we plug into our church community and build one another up for ministry and maturity, when we keep our focus on a heavenly reality and when we long for Christ's return and His award. In that perspective, work can become a very worshipful and meaningful, purposeful experience. Now we've provided a tool for you. Pastor Jason made a booklet and since this uh, Wednesday is the start of Lent, it's the start of a 40-day season working up to Easter week. Um, Pastor Jason created this prayer book that you can use. And so if you do not yet have a tradition of in morning devotions, before you go to work, I would recommend you to use this in the morning. But perhaps you already have a habit of morning devotions. Maybe take this to your workplace do it during lunchtime or one of your breaks or perhaps if that's just not possible maybe at the end of the day uh, it would be very helpful you could write at the end of the day the things that you are worried about your cares that you cast on Jesus and the things that you're thankful about and this kind of habit has a potential of changing your work life Jim Lipinski, the author of Living on Purpose. He says this at the end of the devotional. You were made for God's glory. You were made to know Him and to walk with Him and to help others to do the same. And he said, I hope that this study and it's my personal hope that this sermon series has helped you to see your work as a powerful way to do just that. Now, I'm really excited, like I said, we are the first church to run this sermon series, and now they can take our series and share it with other international churches, and they are also partnering with a local partner. Back in 2005, we established the Vietnam Marketplace Ministry, which is a nationwide network and he is turning this into a Vietnamese language devotional and creating a Vietnamese sermon series that will be on video on their website. And so, to me, well, that makes my work even more purposeful. But I really want to hear back from you. If you remember when we started the series, we gave you this card, Commit Your Work. It's the start of the new year. And as we were starting the new year, I asked you to write down a prayer on the back of the card. A commitment to God. It says, write down a prayer for how you want God to see you, use you in and through your work this year. Now, I don't know about you, I'm like, it's March already. <laughs> I haven't done very much on my goals that I've set for 2019, and two months are already gone. So I got 10 left to do what I said I wanted to do. But I really want to hear back from you, how has this sermon series been helpful to you in your workplace? So I just pull out the card and pull out a pen 
or ask your neighbor for their pen. I just want to take a moment right now and have you fill out this card. If you need a pen, the ushers can come around and bring you a pen. What has been most helpful to you? If you need a card, they can hand you a card as well. If you didn't get a card yet, just raise your hand and our sure will help you with a card or a pen. So maybe over the past two months, what have you been able to implement from what you have learned? And then I'm very curious to know what else might be helpful. Because you're like, wow, well, you know, this is great seven weeks, I still don't understand or I'd like to learn more. How do I do this specifically in my workplace, in my situation, or I'm interested to have another devotional or whatever might be more helpful to you to continue this journey. come around and collect them uh, from you. In the meantime, uh, if you are interested in receiving this uh, prayer and fasting journal for the next 40 days, it's from Wednesday to Palm Sunday. So just uh, raise your hand and the ushers will come and uh, hand out you one of these prayer journals. Journaling is not a, a habit for me, and I journal. This really helps me focus. Otherwise, I don't know about you, when, when I'm praying, my mind goes everywhere. I think about all kinds of things. And just writing them down is really helpful. It helps me to keep focus. So, if, you know, if that's something that you're struggling with, a, a prayer journal is really helpful. Writing down your prayers or your reflections or your cares. your hand up. There's some more hands up. Did we run out? I will email also an e-version, uh, but we'll have some more available print uh, next work week. So it's great. We had a hundred printed and you're all gone. Well, if Dasha would come around and collect your uh, survey card, that would really uh, help me, but also would help the organizations that are working together in equipping people like you in the diaspora around the world being, walking out their faith in their workplace. So maybe if you end up going to Beijing next, or Shanghai, or Dubai, or Norway, they'll be running the same series, perhaps in the next year. we transition to communion as well. Lord, it's just been very uh, exciting to me, Lord, to, to work on this series. It's been very meaningful to think about how you equip us 
to, to see our work in a different way, from a kingdom perspective, in the light of eternity, and to, to gain value from knowing that we reflect your image by working, and work itself. But then to even turn our workplace into a place where you are dwelling. As David prayed, in a dry and weary place he, place, he longed for your presence. And so our work doesn't have to be a dry and weary place. Our workplace can become a place where you dwell. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help each one of us, even throughout this week and throughout the next 40 days as we journey on to Easter, that you would help us to implement some new habits. I know it's hard to do this. It's hard to change our habits, even one habit. But we just pray even for this one habit that we might touch base with you, our ultimate boss, during our work day, at least once a day. Wouldn't that be great? Lord, and so I pray that you help us. We know that we need your help. Lord, we, by ourselves, we wander and stray. Lord, by ourselves, we are lost. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us in our daily work so that we, indeed, not only might be experiencing a more purposeful work, but also that we might glorify you as we go about your Well, early we mentioned how Christ identified with us, particularly he identified in our most dire situations, in our most desperate times. Christ can identify with us, and he did so voluntarily. God so loved this world that he sent his son, but God didn't just send his son and force him. Jesus willingly laid down his glory, became man, and as he was man, he was fully man, and experienced all our temptations and trials and struggles, and yet he committed no sin. And because he was perfect as God and man, throughout it all, he was the worthy <coughs> lamb who was sacrificed for our sins and paid our debts so that we might be set free. And as he rose from the dead, we have this eternal hope. And it's in this eternal hope that our daily lives are transformed. And that's all that. It's just packaged in a small piece of bread in a little plastic cup. Just this memory of all that Christ has done for us. And so this morning, we invite you to come forward to get one of the bread in the cup and bring it back to your seat. But if you are here this morning and you are a guest, if someone brought you or you found us and you're exploring what Christianity is about, maybe you're attending Alpha and you wonder who is Jesus Christ and what is all this about, but you're not yet a Christian. We're so glad that you are here this morning. But I just want to ask you to stay seated uh, because if this is for those who believe in Jesus, that he is the Son of God and died for our sins, rose from the dead, and in this we have the hope of eternal life. So, ushers, if you would come forward and prepare, the worship team will play an instrumental song, and then we will partake of communion together at the end.
received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his body broken. same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. That is, remember the blood of the covenant. Jesus, it is only by your love, your mercy, your grace, that it is possible for us to even dream about a different word life, a different life altogether. Thank you that you paid the price. Thank you that in you we have hope for eternity. Thank you that in you we have hope for today. the cup to the center aisle and the ushers will come around to collect those from you. It's now time to take up our tithes and offerings and I don't know if you've seen in your bulletin but we are quite behind in where we need to be and order to fulfill what's happening in this church and what's happening with city partners and this needs to be met by the end of next month so if you are feel led to give please give joyfully back to the lord what is his and father we pray for this offering lord that you would help us to make ends meet with this church lord and that we would fulfill our quarter four offering goal so that we can just continue to see your glory and honor be done in this church and in this city, Lord, and that is only done by our giving, God. May we joyfully and with happy and humble hearts give back what is yours and all that you have provided for us. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The ushers will come around and pass around the offering basket.
invite the prayer partners to come forward. This message this morning spoke to you. Perhaps you're struggling with health or work, relationships, anxious about future plans, or if you'd like to know more about who is Jesus, and they would love to pray and talk. We are welcome to join at 2 o'clock downtown Paul Nations launching service. So if you're there, I'll see you there. God bless. God bless you too.